Lance Armstrong's team of engineers uses functions to model every aspect of his riding equipment and then uses those models to maximize the speed he obtains versus the energy ex he expends. Hi, my name is Tom Atwater, and in today's lesson, we'll look at modeling real-world data using functions. Let's start off by looking at modeling using a formula. A sphere is contained in a cube tangent to all six faces. Find the surface area of the cube as a function of the radius of the sphere. So to start this problem, we're going to draw a picture of the cube with the sphere inside of it tangent to all six faces. Now, it's not real important that you're incredibly accurate with your drawing, but as best you can to get an idea of what it is that we're going to be looking at. So here we have the cube and the sphere inside of it. We know the surface area of the surface area of the cube is equal to, well, there are six sides to that. So it's six times s squared. The, what we want to do, though, is we want to look at what is the length of one of the sides of the cube. In other words, the little s. So now little s is going to be equal to, well, if we look back at our sphere, we know that the radius, which would go from the center to the actual face of the cube, is r, which means the diameter of our circle is 2r, and therefore that is the length of one of the sides of our cube. And therefore, what we plug in here is 2r for the length of the side. Now that means the surface area is equal to 6 times we replace s with 2r. So it's 2r squared. Now we simplify that. This would be 2 squared, which is 4 times 6. So the surface area is 24. And then it's r also squared. So we leave that as r squared. Now we're going to try a maximum value problem. A square of side x inches is cut out of each corner of an 8 inch by 15 inch piece of cardboard. And the sides are folded up to form an open topped box. Let's take a look at a picture that's already pre-drawn of this box. All right, so here's our piece of cardboard, which we know has a width of 8 inches and a length of 15 inches. And what we're going to do, though, is cut out these little corners, which have a value that's unknown to us right now, so we'll call it x. Well, we then can fold that box up when we cut out the four corners here, 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 and here. And by folding it on the dotted lines, we're going to get this box here. So let's take a look at the dimensions of this box now that we've cut those corners out. Well, of course, the width of the box, which now is missing those two little corners, the, that value of x, means the width of the box is 8 minus 2x. So this length right here would be 8 minus 2x. By the same reasoning, we would look and say, OK, the full length here is 15, but we've eliminated the x and the x in terms of its length, which makes the length now 15 minus 2x. So the length here is 15 minus 2x. What about the height of the box? The height of the box, of course, is this, which is the amount x that we've cut out. And so we could see that here that when we fold it up, the height 
would be equal to x. So now what we can do is actually calculate the volume of the box. So let me do that here. We want to write the volume as a function of x, which is again the height. So the volume is the length, which we said was 15 minus 2x times the width, which is 8 minus 2x, and then times the height x. Remember that multiplication is commutative, so it wouldn't matter what order we put those in. You'll still get the same value of the function for the volume of that box. All right, great job. Now, let's find the domain of the volume as a function of x. Because it, there, the model that we have imposes some restrictions on x. And those restrictions are that all of the measures must be non-negative. In other words, x, the amount that we cut out from each edge, if it were equal to 0, then there would be no volume at all, because we wouldn't be able to fold anything up. So that means that 0 is an endpoint but it's not inclusive because we can't actually have a value of x equaling 0. Now, by the same reasoning, if we were to go all the way up to x equals 4, then let me just quickly draw that so you could see what's happening in that case. Here's my piece of paper, or cardboard rather. And if we said that we were going to take 4 inches for the value of x, we'll realize that the same type of thing that we experienced before is going to happen because that whole side is only 8. And so what would happen is our dotted line would be here, which means when we folded it up, we would just get a piece of cardboard folded up together. In other words, there's no volume there. So 4 is the other endpoint. So the domain, the way we would write the domain is as the interval with open parentheses, 0, 4. All right. Well, next what I'd like to do is an example where we find or graph this volume. And we're going to graph the volume as a function of x over the domain that we just found in part b. And we're going to use the maximum finder on the grapher to determine the maximum volume that such a box can actually hold. So what we want to do then is take a look at the graph itself. The graph has this shape to it. And so you can see that what's going to happen is somewhere in this area, we have a maximum value. And of course, there are different ways of finding this. But with the grapher, it certainly is easy enough to plug it in and then use the function that allows us to find that point, which is right here now. And we can see that the happens when x is 1 and 2 thirds, right? Because it's 1.6 repeating. And that gives us a value, in this case, where it's saying y. That really is our volume. So it's telling us that the volume in this case, 90.740774, et cetera. So what that really says is, of course, we're going to approximate it. The maximum volume would be 90 and 74 hundredths cubic inches. And again, that's when x was equal to 1 and 2 thirds. And that's actually the next question. How big should the cutout squares be in order to produce the box of maximum value? And we just looked at that on the grapher, and we're saying that it would be exactly 1 and 2 thirds inches to cut out as the side of each square. OK. Now, when thinking graphically becomes a genuine part of your problem solving strategy, it is sometimes actually easier to start with the graphical model than it is to go straight to the algebraic formula. The graph itself provides valuable information about the function. And so it gives us a good overall picture. Let's work an example where we do this. 
A small satellite dish is packaged with a cardboard cylinder for protection. The parabolic dish is 24 inches in diameter and 6 inches deep. And the diameter of the cardboard cylinder is 12 inches. How tall must the cylinder be to fit in the middle of the dish and be flush with the top of the dish? Well, what we should do, of course, is look at the picture of this. So I have two that I want to describe. Here's an artist's rendering of the parabolic dish, the top. And what then I've done is superimpose that idea onto a Cartesian coordinate system because that cross-section transposed here yields a parabola where um, it goes to the points negative 12, 6 and positive 12, 6. And it also goes through the origin right here. So what we want to do then is actually calculate by looking at the fact that there's going to be a cardboard cylinder inside of this. And let me show you. What we're going to do is, let me do my rendition of this. We've got our parabola. And we're going to have a cardboard box, cylinder, actually not a box, but a cylinder, inside there that's going to give it protection. And what we know is that this point over here is negative 12, 6. And this point over here is 12, 6. And of course, we know it's going through the origin. So what we're going to do is we know that it's a parabola. So we know it starts with y equals x squared. But then we have to make sure that it actually fits our exact model. Well, one of the changes, of course, would be that this is not going up through the points. For example, if, if x were 12, that would be 12 squared, 144. So we know that it's not going through that. What's happened is we've multiplied it by some value, which we'll call k. Now, what we have to do is substitute the points into this formula and make sure that when we calculate k, both points fit. So let's start off and substitute in 12 for x and 6 for y. So we get 6 equals k times 12 squared, which means that 12 squared, of course, is 144. So k would be 6 divided by 144, which reduces to 1 24th. So our equation is y equals 1 24th x squared. And that gives us the formula for the parabola. Now, the diameter is 12 for that particular cylinder. And the reason we know that is that it's got to be flush with the top as well as protecting down at the bottom. So now use x equals 6, which is, of course, half the diameter, to find the y value for the bottom of the cylinder. So what we have is y equals 1 over 24 times 6 squared. 6 squared, of course, is 36. So really, it's 36 over 24, which works out to be exactly 1 and a half inches. So now, we're not quite done. What we're going to do is we take the original 6 inches, which is this height up here, and we subtract 1 and a half inches from that so that the height of the cylinder and the one and a half inches is this part here. Let me do that in a different color. The one and a half inches is this part here. And so what we do is subtract the six minus the one and a half. And that tells us that the height of the cylinder is four and a half inches. All right. 
So that was example where we had a picture that helped us figure out the actual formula. Now what I'd like to do is work an example of unit conversions. In some disciplines, this is called dimensional analysis. So let's take a look. How many rotations does a 15-inch radius tire make per second on a sport utility vehicle traveling 70 miles per hour? So what we're going to start with is the fact that it's traveling at 70 miles per hour. So that would look like this, 70 miles per one hour. So the next thing we need to do would be to multiply this by the fact that in one hour, there are 60 minutes. And then we need to multiply it by the fact that in one minute, there are 60 seconds. So this is setting it up so that now we have it in miles per second. So we're not quite done, but at least we have the time into seconds. So the next thing we need to do would be to multiply this by the fact that there are 5,280 feet in one mile. And I'm going to essentially, if I had more room, I'd do it there, but I'm going to write it here. And again, 5,000. 280 feet per one mile. Now we still have to go further because we actually wanted to get it down so into inches so that we have that 12 inches, and this is feet, so I should have put that there, sorry. We're going to now multiply this by the fact that 12 inches is the equivalent of one foot. So the last conversion we need to do is the rotations per inches. And the per inches part is this. We know that the radius of the tire is 15. So we're interested in the circumference of the tire, which means the circumference is 2 times pi times r. Twice the radius would be 30. So that means in one full rotation, it would actually cover 30 pi inches along the road. So what we have is one rotation over 30 pi inches. All right, so now we go through and we can cancel out the units, which will show us that we are actually going to find the correct final answer of, well, here's miles, which Really, remember, this is one long string, so it's going to cancel those miles. The hour will cancel the hour, the minute with the minute. This <clears throat> second actually has nothing to cancel it, and that's a good thing. If we now go to the lengths, we have feet ca canceling the feet, inches canceling inches. There's nothing that's going to going to eliminate the rotation, so we know that our answer will be in rotations per second, which is what we were looking for. All right, so you can use a calculator to do the arithmetic here, which you would multiply 70 times 1 times 1 times 5,280 times 12, <clears throat> and then that all has to be divided by the product of 60, 60, and 30 pi. Doing all of that, you'll find that it's equal to 13 and seven one hundredths, and that's rotations per second. All right. Well, you know what? Now it's time for you to try a problem. So the problem is going to be similar to the example we just did, and here it is for you. A tire of a moving bicycle has radius 16 inches. If the tire is making two rotations per second, Find the bicycle's speed in miles per hour. Pause the video to work on this problem, and when you're finished, restart the video to check your solution. All right, let's see how you did on that example. So here is the original problem, which is that we are 
two rotations per second with a 16 inch radius tire. So let's work out the dimensional analysis. So the circumference we know is 32 pi inches because the radius was 16 and we multiply two times pi times r, in other words, twice the radius. And that's per one rotation. We need to multiply that by the fact that it's going two rotations per one second. And then we have to start converting those seconds into hours. So what we know is it's 60 seconds per one minute. And then we have to do 60 minutes per one hour. And then we've taken care of the time factor because we want this in miles per hour. So the next thing we have to do is convert this inches into um, miles. So we do that by saying that we know there's one foot in 12 inches. And then we say, of course, that in one mile, there are 5,280 feet. Okay. So we cancel things out just to make sure that we've done the units part of it correctly. So what we can do is say this, the inches is going to cancel with this inches. The feet is going to cancel with the feet. And so we're left with miles, which is what we expected. Then we go through and we can cancel out rotation with rotation, seconds with seconds, um, this minute would cancel with this minute, and then we're left with hours. So in fact, we've set it up correctly because we're left with miles per hour. So then the next thing is you do out all the arithmetic using your calculator, and you'll find that it's approximately 11 and 42 one hundredths miles per hour. Well, I hope that's the answer that you got when you worked on that problem yourself. What we're going to do now is explore curve fitting using our grapher. Let's take a look at an example. The following table records the low and high daily temperatures observed on 9-9-1999 in 20 major American cities. Find a function that approximates the high temperature, which we'll call y, as a function of the low temperature, which we'll call x. Use this function to predict the high temperature that particular day for Madison, Wisconsin, given that the low temperature was 46. So let's take a look at the table so that we see the kind of figures that we're working with. So here's the table. And we're not going to go through all of the numbers here, but you can see that there's our 20 cities. And you can see that um, Madison is not on here. And that's one of the reasons we want to do that calculation. But what we do is we plug all of that information into a grapher. And we make a scatter plot, or I should say the grapher does for us. And you can see that there appears to be some kind of a relationship where the data is clustered within that elongated ellipse that I just drew. Let's take a look and actually see what a line might look like. And you can see that the data is falling fairly near that line. And what we're going to use is the line of best fit regression analysis, which the grapher does for us, OK? And what it's going to do is actually figure out the slope of this line, as well as what would be the y-intercept. Or in this case, we're looking at the high temperature as being on the y value and the low temperature on the x. All right, so let's take a look at what the grapher gave us. 
the grapher gave us that y was equal to 97 hundredths, whoops, I put the decimal in the wrong place, 97 hundredths x plus the y-intercept of 23 degrees. So now what we do is we substitute in the low temperature of 46 for x. So we get y equals 0 0.97 times 46. And then after we multiply those, we add the 23. And what we find is that the temperature is approximately 67 and 62 hundredths degrees for that high temperature in Madison, Wisconsin. Now that example that we're doing here is using linear regression. Now that's because the curve, because remember I said we were going to do curve fitting? Well the curve in this case was that straight line that we saw from the grapher. As you will study in the rest of this book, there are many types of regressions that model real world data. And they have curved lines. There's quadratic, there's exponential, there's also logarithmic. Okay, so in this lesson, we learned modeling real world data using functions. Be sure to work the exercises that your teacher assigns, and we'll see you next time.